from the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. Monday, May 23. Uh, John, check out here. Are we good? Yeah, I'm good. Okay. Uh, this is Monday, May 23rd, 2011. We're in um, suburb of Chicago, Illinois, with uh, Reverend Wheeler Parker Jr. to do an oral history interview for the National Museum of African American History and Culture and the Library of Congress in their joint project entitled The Civil Rights History Project. My name is Joe Munier of the Southern Oral History Program at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and I'm with videographer and filmmaker John Bishop. Again, Reverend Parker, thank you very much for joining us and fitting us into our, your schedule as we came here to Chicago. My pleasure. Thank you. Um, I wanted to start, maybe we'll, maybe we'll start with an event that's, that's very recent and work our way back through the history. Um, you were just down in Mississippi for the unveiling of a historical marker at the Bryant store, and I wonder if you could maybe start there in our conversation today and talk about that experience and your thoughts and feelings about, about that. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, we were at the, uh, the Freedom Trail. They're going to do like 25 markers and the Emmett Till markers at the Bryant grocery store is number one. And uh, it was a very moving, overwhelming uh, event and well put together. I was very pleased with the marker and the program that they had there. So uh, brought back memories. I'm right down the road from where I used to live and across from where I went to school. So it brought back a lot of memories. Of course, the event at the store that day and that marker represented, uh, marker tells us where we were, 1955, where we are today and what we need to do. So it was a very, very moving uh, event. Well put together, well managed, and I give a lot of kudos to the people who did it. Have you, have you traveled, well, how often have you traveled to Mississippi in recent years and decades? Mm, I'm probably down there about twice a year, mm. sometimes more, you know. Mm. I love to go to Mississippi, that's home, you know. Mm. Nothing wrong with the land and the dirt, the people weren't too cool, but, <laughs> <laughs> but Mississippi is okay. You moved to um, Chicago, I think, in 47. I moved to Summit, Argo, mm -hmm. right outside Chicago in 1947. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you just mentioned your memories of Mississippi. Can you maybe take us through what you saw and experienced when Paint a picture of the landscape when you got off the train back in 55 when you returned there for that summer visit. What did the house, the, the landscape, the little town of money, what, mm -hmm. how would you describe all of that? Country. <laughs> Country. That's all you could say. I think in money it may have been 50 people, and 50 people thereabout, give or take a little bit. And that's good, rich delta soil. You don't want people on this for growing crops. And it was ideal for that. And that's what we did. When we got there, we got busy, got our cotton sacks, and went to the cotton field. I think I made about eight bucks that week. So it was a fun time for me, we were swimming and you know, 16 year, we, we did what 16 year olds, teenagers did, did, did. And we had a great time until. Mm -hmm. um, can you paint a picture of, um, of your um, grandfather? Uh, my grandfather, uh, can I say, what can I say about Papa? No nonsense. The way he carried himself, he carried himself with dignity and great respect, and he got great respect from people. Gentle man, always willing to help, but he carried himself in that kind of way that people really respected and they looked up to him. He was a man of means. Said what he meant, meant what he said. How about your grandmother? Grandma was easy going. <laughs> <laughs> Grandma was so easy going that her sons asked her once, say, Mama, when are you going to whip us? That's pretty easy going. Now, my mother, I wouldn't dare ask that. <laughs> she was a school teacher, very lovable lady, and just believed everything her boys said. <laughs> and uh, she, she was just a very likable person, and, you know, to know her is to love her. How about the. Um can you say a little bit more just descriptively about the house, about the little town of money, about the about Darkfield Road? Mm -hmm. Going down Darkfield Road, 
uh, and I can't get the directions right, going Dorf Air Road from Bryant's store, to the left is like a body of water. I can remember when I was like seven years old, we lived there. And this, um, I forgot what we called it, it would just overflow and our houses on the other side of the road and water would run under the house all night, wash the bridges out, and you couldn't, it was fun to us, you know, to see all this water, clear water, you could see fish is going, but it wouldn't build up because it was going back to the opening in the back, and we wanted to play in it. Didn't know the seriousness of it, like just what happened, you know. But uh, to the, and where the water was running, that's where the crops grew. I mean, cotton go right up to the house. You can go out the window and go to work right there. Everything is right there. And I remember when we lived there, we live next door to my grandfather. There's like a fruit orchard between. We live next door in a shotgun house, brand new shotgun house. We lived in, and then next to us was a sawmill. I actually experienced lumber being made. Bring these big logs in, and man, this big saw, it would be screaming, you know, cutting that wood. So it was a, right there was the congregation of a clump of people right there. And other than that, you just got cotton fields, no, not much in terms of corn or edible vegetables. Cotton was the main thing. Um, we had a train that ran not too far away. We had a church right nearby where I started school. One room, one teacher taught everybody, and she had much order. I remember once uh, my uncle made the teacher kind of angry, and he told her she laughed like a duck. So she had him to go out and bring some switches in, and I was terrified. I just, this lady's gonna get us, you know, back then. Uh, you, was, you, you was open, like open, just open to be had, you know. So she had no trouble out of me. I was only about seven years old. And of course, uh, the next year I went uptown. <laughs> I laughed because uptown is still very rural and very country. And I uh, went to school up there where we did have classrooms. So it, it was a very wonderful experience, and, and I remember and the cemetery was right by the church. I understand now because they didn't have any hearse, anything to take anywhere, so they buried you right outside the church. Same place they had planned, to, they had dug a grave for Emmett Till. So uh, that's what I remember, and some people lived back down in the woods, like they were all f surrounded by farmland. Everything is farming. Few settlements, but everything related to the farming. And uptown, we had three or four stores, or there were very few stores. And um, that was the extent of it. I mean, you didn't know anything about fast food, you know fast food. So they had to cook three times a day. I mean, you had to eat. You could not go uh, into the cotton field with no cornflakes. We never heard of cornflakes and cold cereals like that. You had to eat some rabbit, some chicken, and some cornbread to go out that field, because that sun would zap that milk out of you real quick. So we had a wonderful, it was a wonderful time, you know, just, didn't know anything else. I tell people, I say, I love picking cotton. I love the country. They say, you didn't know any better. <laughs> so I hadn't stayed there long enough. But they would brag on us. And then I can remember in the fall, come time, because you could only go to school after the cotton was in. So my dad was like 18 years old when he got graduated from eighth grade. Because you have to uh, put in so many hours to, to finish a grade. So, you started after the cotton was in, maybe November, so you're always behind. And I, and I think what is remarkable is that they held to the fact that you had to have so many quarters or, or whatever it was in the past. And so he's 18, <laughs> getting out of the eighth grade, but they held to the land. Got one of his history, got one of his school books from 19, I think, 25. And he's telling about he met my mother and his heart was made happy that day. <laughs> So we, so we have a lot of history there. Uh, and those are the things you kind of remember, uh, the little things like that, that happened around the farm. When you got on a train to head back down to, well, head down to um, Mississippi in, in 55, did, could, was your mood just one of general enthusiasm and looking forward to the trip and all, or did you also carry with you some sense of it's not the place I now know, it's not Chicago, it's a different place, I need to shift my behavior a little, or was that in your mind at the time? For sure. I said I was born, and you always heard the stories. Very much aware of where you're going. They said you're going, behind, going down behind the Iron Curtain. They equated it with going to, at that time, Russia was called the Iron Curtain. You knew exactly, at least I did, knew exactly 
where you were going and what could happen because they told you the stories of things that had happened to people and you knew that you had no protection under the law if anything happened while you were there. And when I went into that store, that's one thing that struck me. When I got down there, I was very much aware of it. Uh, but your friends, we had so much fun, man. It should have been a law against it. You know, we just had to get fun with nothing, you know, and swimming and just, and most telling a lot of jokes and lies, that's what they were telling. <laughs> so it, it was, uh, yeah, you were very much aware of where you were going, at least I was. Mm -hmm. They made you, they, because they want you to survive. And they know what could happen. They know what had happened, what was happening, and what could happen. And what did happen, that's what they were afraid of. How long were you planning to stay that summer? Uh, I don't know. I think we're going to stay a few weeks. Definitely longer than we had, than we stayed. We only stayed a week. Yeah. And we were only there three, three days before this incident happened from Sunday to Wednesday, you know. And uh, everything just got out of kilter right there. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about how you remember those first couple of days before the Wednesday evening at the store. Picking cotton. And man, I was, I was right at home, you know. I, was old. I think I picked about seven. I could, when I left at six years old, I could pick 100 pounds of cotton. And right now, I could have probably picked 100, but it was so hot. Cotton started blooming late August. It's not the full bloom, and it's so hot, you cannot stay out there all day. So you pick the half a day, and sometimes we, we'd go swimming. I remember uh, they said snakes wouldn't bite in the water, so we beat the water and tried to run the snakes out, and you see the snakes' little head swimming, and we jump in there. Didn't have good sense jumping there with the snakes swimming and, and uh, going some out of a watermelon patch and gather up. And jokes is the number one thing down south. I mean, everybody just seemed like a new jokes with me, you know. And my uncle was driving a car, he's my age, and we riding around in a car, and, and he let me drive. Man, it was a, it was a fun time. We were, I was having a ball, and the girls around, and it's just great time, you know. Yeah, great time. Let me, let me have you describe um, that, that late Wednesday when I guess you all come home and have supper and then decide to... Why don't you open the pause for a second? Sure. Okay. We're back on after a short pause just to check our equipment. Um, Reverend Parker, I was, I was just about to raise this, now we turn to things that are much less, mm -hmm. memory is much more complicated and much mm -hmm. less happy than the ones you were just describing. Um, can you talk about that, that Second half of the day on Wednesday, um, of that of that visit in August of fifty five. Mm -hmm. We got that at Sunday, and Wednesday was the first day that we rode to this little town. I guess it was about three miles down the Scrabble Road, and uh, exc still excitement. But teenagers got a car to yourself, so that was great. And uh, it's the end of the day, correct? Yeah, n near the end of the day. Uh, Dusk, it wasn't quite dusk, but by the time we left, we stayed, I can't remember how long we stayed there. So we get to town and people gathering up from the little settlements there. And it's still a small town, it's not like Greenwood. And the guys out there playing checkers and, and I decided to go into the store and purchase some things. Don't know what I purchased, but I went in there and purchased some things. And while I was in the store, Emmett came in. And when Emmett came in, I felt, you know, this apprehension because I knew how he was and I knew where we were. <coughs> Excuse me. So I left Emmett in the store and Simeon came in right behind him. Then the both of them came out of the store and after they came out and facing the store, Miss Bryant came out and she's walking to facing the store to the right of the store. And Emmett whistled. And we just could not believe. I mean, this this is like something out of the sky blue, you know. Where did this come from? What's wrong with him? And even now, we don't know what possessed him. He had no idea where he was. He had no idea, didn't have an idea of the danger. And so she proceeded to go around, and somebody said that she's going to get a gun. I think that's when we started rushing to the car. I don't know how many of us in the car. It was a lot of us in the car. We rushed to the car. By this time, Emmett is scared. We get in the car and someone has dropped a cigarette on the floor. Too young to be smoking anyway. But anyway, someone dropped a cigarette. So Emmett is telling my uncle, let's get going, let's get going, let's get going. 
and they want to find a cigarette before we start pulling off. So my uncle finally take, take off. He's younger than I am. Uh, but he's 16. So we finally take off, and then we're going down this gravel road, across the railroad track, down the gravel road. We look behind, man, dust is flying everywhere. And there's a car behind us. Oh my goodness, where did it come from? I mean, this is country. We didn't see any cars. All of a sudden, there's a car right there. And so we, my uncle sped up and pulled to the side. And man, I don't know if we let it continue, stop before we jumped out and running through the cotton field. I remember Emmett running and falling and people falling over one another and the cotton bowls that were not fresh, they were still having fresh to open up. They were beating our legs and the car went right by. Nothing to that. We regroup at the edge of the road and Simeon, he, I don't know why, he's sitting up there. Simeon was 12. 12 was different from 16, you know. He's still sitting there in the car, you know. So somewhere in between there, we started talking and Emmett asked us not to tell my grandfather. And uh, of course, there was a girl that she said, I know those people, and this is not over with. You're going to hear more about this. The girl was not with you at that time, though. No, no, she that was. We, we met up with some. I, I, we stopped at someone's house, I think, yeah. before we got to our house. Yeah. Mm. I think you of course, she says she was driving the car now. <laughs> <laughs> but I should say for the record, you're alluding to all the representations made about these circumstances by people who, in fact, were not there. That's <laughs> yes. one of them, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She says she was driving. Yeah. The imagination is powerful. Yeah. But anyway, we, we met and we talked. And, at this point, we didn't take it serious. I felt a relief, you know, the car went by, and it's like, it's gonna go away, you know. I didn't, I didn't feel we we're gonna really hear anything more from this, I really didn't. You know, I knew what he did was a no-no. And so that night went by, I didn't tell my grandfather, I don't think anybody told me. I don't think he really ever heard there's been questions about that, but so, Wednesday went by, Thursday, nothing. We, we, we didn't even talk about it again. I don't ever remember us talking about it again at all. We forgot about it to some degree. Thursday went by, Friday went by, Saturday, and Saturday in the country, it, everybody goes to the big town. Man, we went to a Greenwood and people from everywhere, all the girls and the guys and they're walking down Johnson Street, man, just, it was just excitement to see all these people coming to, in their car, their wagon, they're doing their shopping for the week, whatever. And we stayed there. And then about 12 or thereabout, we left. Stopped by a place called Four Fifths, I believe. And I, I still there, somebody was talking about it the other day. And it's one of those, what they call juke joints or, uh, Somebody's house, they got drinking and stuff, and we stayed there. We got home, I guess. We left there, and on the way home, Maurice, Emmett, and myself, and my Uncle Maurice, he's, he's got a little high, and he ran over a dog. And when he ran over the dog, Emmett started crying, you know. I mean, to me, the dog should have, shouldn't have been in the street, you know. But anyway, Emmett was very fond of animals. He had a sensitive side for animals. So we got home and went to bed. Uh, my, I slept with Maurice and Emmett slept with Simeon. And my cousin Curtis is here by now. But he hasn't been with you the last few days. <laughs> no, Curtis just, we get, we get it back home, Curtis is there, we haven't seen him. Yeah. But, but he told the story of what happened to Stuart. Right, and again, another, another incident. Yeah. Before, before you go forward with that story, if I forgive me for interrupting, I want to ask no you, take you back just for a moment. You said a moment ago that recalling the visit to the Bryant store, mm -hmm. that when you stepped in and then Emmett came in behind you, you felt a little just instinctive apprehension. Oh, yeah. I yeah, know yeah. the rules and the, the, the informal rules. I know him. Yeah. I live next door to him. <laughs> exactly. So tell me, tell me about him. Well, I have to come back to Argo where we live. You know, he's he, he the kind of guy, he loves pranks. And what he thought was funny wasn't funny all the time. We go to visit him after he moved to Chicago, 64th and St. Lawrence. So we walking down the street. My cousin Sonny, you got a cousin over here. She probably should interview him too. But anyway, we walking down the street. All of a sudden, Emmett says, and he stuttered bad. He said, I got my two big cousins here from Argo, Illinois, 
and can't none, none, nobody beat him up. And we looked at him, have you lost your man? We grabbed him up real quick. Cause the gangs were bad in Chicago and in the suburb, you're not gang orientated. So those are the kind of things he would do. And it was funny to him. It wasn't funny to us at all cause while we were concerned, he could have got us killed. So I knew how he was, I knew the things he did, and other things he'd done, you know, as we grew up, you know, just, just off, off color type stuff, you know. And I, I just knew when he come in, something could happen. I didn't think anything was gonna happen, but I knew something could happen. And, and just, to, just to say a little bit about this, it, it doesn't sound as if you're saying that these were in any way hard-edged or mean-spirited things. He was just playful and exactly. provoked the attention of his friends in a playful way. And that kind of I never saw him angry or bitter at anybody. Never. Never. I live next door to him. He's always doing something, though, because he was the center. Of, if he was there, he was the center of attraction. And it wasn't planned, it's just natural. I told him he's Leo the Lion. <laughs> he's just a natural leader. Just needed some direction sometimes. <laughs> but he's gonna do something to get their attention. When you were 16 and you were saying Greenwood that night, and I know you were both down from Chicago and you guys knew each other well and all that, was there any part of you being 16 and he was 14? Did you feel like, oh, I'm a little bigger and older, I wish I could kind of leave the younger guys behind and go do my thing, or was... Well, Emmett, Emmett didn't, he wasn't really, you're right. When you're earlier in age, every, you won't stay within your age. It's not like now it could span from 70 to 80. But when you're 16 and 14, you 16, hey, you 14, you know. <laughs> and Simi was 12, he was, Simi was. Just set that back up, please. No big deal. Simi, Simi was like, didn't count, you know. <laughs> back then, he just didn't count because he was not a, uh, he was not, uh, he wouldn't be a player with us. Let's take a pause and all. I get it. I think it's good news. Okay. Okay. Let me have you go back and tell us again, just the yeah. age difference thing. So yeah, the, the age different thing. And, that, and it, you know, it's kind of like when you're going to school. If you are nine, you're not going to have a girlfriend that's seven. She got to be nine, too. You know, she got to be in your class. So there was an age distinction. And Emmett, he wanted to, when his mother would take him places, she would take me, too, you know. So he kind of like looked up to me, you know, and I'm not interested in being his leader, but you know, he just kind of, I'm the, I'm the upperclassman, I'm the older person. So I, I, knew, who, I knew what the deal was, you know, but he wasn't gonna listen to me or anything, but he, he, he looked up to me. And uh, but that age distinction definitely was there and you knew it. Mm -hmm. um, let me have you, um, thank you for that. And let me have you turn again to, to Saturday. Mm -hmm. 27th of, of August, 1955. Yeah, Saturday, I, and we got home, I think about 12 o'clock, it was dark, and it's so dark down there. Now. I mean, you, if the moon is not shining, you just cannot see your hand before your face. Just dark. And uh, so we got in and went to bed, and like I say, Maurice got in bed with Maurice, and Simeon, uh, Bobo, and Matilda got in bed with, uh, with uh, Simeon. It was a big house. Everybody paints it as a shack. They insist on calling it a shack. It was a former landlord's home. Not that it mean anything. If you look at the house, that's a screen in porch across the front. That's money. <laughs> a full screen in porch all the way across the front of the house. Then you got four big rooms. You got a little space in between. The kitchen is off to the back. So it was a very large house. And, um, I, and I guess about two going forward, I guess about 2, 2.30 in the morning, my grandfather said it was, I hear these guys talking. So you wake up? I woke up. And man, I became alarmed. Because they're talking about what happened at the store. And my man is just racing. They said, we're looking for a fat boy from Chicago. I said, man, I'm getting ready to die. These people are going to kill us. Because I heard all... Simeon, my uncles lived there, they had a different take on the South than I did. I heard all these stories and I took everything literally. That was one of my problems in life. Whatever you said, like my mother told me one day, she said, I'm killing you, I'm gonna kill you, boy. So I hey, you gonna kill me? I took off. <laughs> I took off running, you know. She had my uncle to catch me. <laughs> Got a whipping in the cornfield, she beat me with the corn stalks. 
So when they say, we're looking for a fat boy from Chicago, and I heard what they had done to people, killed people and threw people in the river and all that, I said, man, I'm getting, we're getting ready to die in this house. So the first thing I come back to me is my religious upbringing. I started praying. I, start, I literally started praying, and I just say, God, if you just let me get out of this, I'm going to do it. It's just something about when you think you're getting ready to die. All the wrong things you've ever done seem like it come through your mind. I was watching a World War II film the other day, and this man's ship had broke up, and he was out in this ocean. And he said a shock was coming straight for him. He said, God, if you let me live, I'm going to treat my little brother right. He said, I'm going to marry a young girl, and I'm going to treat her right. Your mind changes when death, you feel death is imminent. He said the shark went that way, and he saw his friend's leg go up in the air. But what I'm trying to say is something about when you think you're close to death. You don't have to be close, but you think you are. Your whole demeanor and attitude and value of life just change. Nothing else was important to me at that time but trying to survive. And at 16, I was not ready to die. Uh, according to my religious upbringing, and, and I wasn't fit to die. So I prayed, and, uh, and I could hear them coming. And they come and tore my room. I'm the first room on the right, facing the front of the house. I'm the first room on the right. My grandfather was the first room on the left. So by the time they said we're looking for a fat boy from Chicago, my grandfather had no idea where he was. So they start, he started, he just started and went around. Your grandfather met him on the porch. Grandfather, Papa, Papa met him on the porch. And then came into your room. Came in, they came into my room and, uh, and I can remember, he's, I'm stretching my eyes, I'm shaking like a leaf on the tree and, and uh, just then in walked this guy with a gun in one hand. And I was always afraid of guns. I was always afraid of guns. Emmy wasn't really afraid of guns because there was a gun left in the house once and he got it, he could have killed us. You know, we playing with the gun in the house, you know, they, we had those old shiffer rolls and, and uh, but I was afraid of guns. So they came in and this guy had his pistol in one hand and a flashlight in the other. It was pure terror. It's just like if you could just disappear and just go away, it's like a nightmare. And things are not ending fast enough, you know, and I'm waiting, am I gonna be shot? And I remember closing my eyes and they walked past me. They didn't say anything and they didn't do anything. Still scared, they went to the next room. Curtis is there, he's there now. Curtis didn't wake up. Passed by my Uncle Robert, he didn't wake up. They went into the third room where Uncle Simeon and so I could hear him talking and he aroused him out of the bed. He had no idea what was going on. But like I said, even Simeon, those guys, they didn't feel about it like I felt about it. Simeon didn't know what was going on. And I could hear him talking, not a lot of audible or clear stuff, but they were mad at him. He wanted to put his socks on, his shoes, you know. He think he at home, you know, he don't know who he's dealing with. And, and he's saying, yeah, no, he's not saying the right words. And they were fierce. I, I think these guys, in hindsight, I think they had been drinking. I, I mean, you have to almost get drunk to do something like what they did. I feel, I, I just feel human had to have some kind of assistance to do what they did to that kid. So they finally uh, left and it was dark. Can I ask you, mm -hmm. your, um, your grandmother tried to intercede mm -hmm. and, and persuade these men not to take Emmett away. Mm -hmm. Did, was that just part of the general conversation you heard in the other room? Did you make, did that come clear? I was, no, that didn't come clear to me. I, I was, I was told what she was doing later. Gotcha. It's just conversation going on and, and I know, and I know, I know they were mad. Yeah. They, they were, they were angry. Yeah. And I didn't hear anything Emmett really say, but it, they were angry mm -hmm. and they left. And when they left, my grandmother left and my grandfather left. I'm 16, you know, 16 then and different from 16 now. I mean, this is the protection. <laughs> the protection is gone. And in my mind, they're coming back. I don't know why, but in my mind, so I'm suffering from pure terror, you know, just, just hell on earth. 
So I said, my cause grandma would not stay. And she had my grandfather take her to her brother's house, Crosby, I think it's up in Sumner. So I got up, I said, man, I said, they're coming back. I'm putting my shoes on. I didn't like bare, being bare, in the bare feet that much. So, so when they come back, when they pull in the yard, I'm headed, because the, the woods are back, I said, I'm heading for the woods. And the strange thing, my uncle in the bed with me never woke up. Maurice never woke up. Curtis never woke up. Robert never woke up. They woke Sammy up and told him to go back to sleep. So it's when you say that, you mean the two men? Mylon and Brian. Yeah. yeah. The 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 rigmarole. The rig, They didn't just say wake up, Simeon. The rigmarole. You know the conversation stuff. He was waking by that. And um, I'm waiting for day. It seemed like daylight would never come. Never, never come. It just so long. Nobody talked to anybody. I didn't wake my uncle up. I didn't go to the next room. I just stayed right there. So when they my plans are if they come in the yard, I'm headed out the back. So the daylight finally came. And, uh, was your father home by then? Are your grandfather home by then? No. no. Well, he came, he, I don't know exactly what time he got back, but he, didn't, he, didn't, he never really brought us together to talk to us. And we just know that they had, we, I knew they had taken him. And there was calls being made. Curtis was very courageous. He went to the landowner's house and he called. Uh, he was that kind of kid. If Curtis had woke up, it probably been, they probably, a lot of us probably would have got killed because he was going to probably try to do something or say something. That's the kind of person he was. And uh, as a matter of fact, he became a policeman and he was a bodyguard from here, Washington, for, before he died. So Curtis did call and then his mother called Emmett Till's mother. And my mother got involved and my dad had a brother live there. And he came over, and again, he come with his pistols. So here's more terror, you know, said, so, man, this is real serious, you know. So he's going to take me from Money, Mississippi, up to Duck Hill. And somebody in the crowd, I, I was always a very serious-minded kid. Somebody in the crowd said, look, we're going to send him up there to get you. Just like that. They did not believe that Emmett's going to be killed. They still were kind of joking about it, because the man told them they're going to take him and you know, punishment and bring him back. So we're gonna send him up there to get you. I didn't sleep a wink. From that time, 2.30, for tw over 24 hours I did not sleep. Cause I was up at my uncle's house and every time a car would go by, I'm looking for him, you know, I'm looking. And eventually my uncle, he took me to the train station a couple of times to get on. Cause I didn't have any reservations. And uh, eventually I caught a train uh, early that morning, I think about five, it was dark, I caught a train, got to Memphis, thinking I'm in Chicago, and I'm going to a washroom, and everybody said, you can't go inside, you, know, you can't go in there. I'm scared all over again, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm just, it's so big, and this train station, I think I'm in Chicago, I'm in Memphis, and they got the signs, called it, and, and it seemed like I was never gonna get where I could just relax. So that's, that's where it went that they, uh, they, they took him from the house. found your way through all that incredibly difficult circumstance back up to Chicago and um, therefore you you were here and attended the funeral mm -hmm. and I want to ask about that but I, I want to ask about what you recall for that those, those few days when you arrived back to Chicago and uh, Mrs. Till the extended family your parents just what We, we, I arrived at the train station. I, I can't even remember who picked me up, but I know that they whisked me off to uh, Miss Till's house over on 64th and St. Lawrence. And when I, when I got upstairs, you know, everybody's sitting around solemn because they don't know what happened to Emmett and they had not found his body. And um, they looking at me and, you know, and. Uh, Miss Till told me to go hug my mother, you know, and I did that. 
it wasn't too much said because people just in a grieving state. By now, they, they think that something has happened and I understand they have been searching around bridges and normal places that people are found. Um, so I got back to Argo and to me it was like a nightmare and my life kind of resumed as it was. People would ask me about it and one day I was right in the town here, I saw a guy, his name was JP, he had a jewelry store. And I saw him and he looked just like Milan. And man, my heart just boom, like a stop beat. I said, man, he's here because I, I, I didn't put it past them pursuing to do what, if they wanted to do something to me. So, and I got past that because I realized later that it was the, the Jewish, and I knew him, but he looked so much like him, you know, so. Uh, it, it changed my whole life, really. It changed, I mean, I could never forget it. And it's like, since 1955, it's a constant thing. I just learned how to handle, uh, about my religious upbringing it taught me how to deal with negative situation. You know, you got to exhale, you got to let it go. And you have to, I tell people, you're full of trouble, it's how you handle the trouble. One thing that uh, always bothered me and I, I don't know if it bothered me, but I can't understand, can't explain, is that I went to the funeral, I said, this is not imminent. I said, it's like it never happened. And I said, maybe I'll say, say some people, I asked people, I said, maybe you didn't stay the shock. I said, I'm gonna see him again. I went to the funeral, no remorse, no sadness whatsoever. And that's where I lived during those times. And now I go and I talk about it or I see the video and then I'm crying, so I ain't got too old to be crying now. But uh, during that time, that was not Emmett. It's not the guy I knew. That was a monster in there, you know. And I always had it in here, I'm gonna see him again, you know. That's what I said. And, uh, and we believe in hereafter, so we believe you can meet again. So I, I guess that's what I was trying to say, I don't know, but it, it changed my whole life. I could never, I could never be the same again. Because it always came to my mind, the promise that you made. And it was always brought to my attention. Can you describe the funeral? A lot of people. Just conglomeration of people, you know, the, the solemn atmosphere there, you know, it's just, it's just unbelievable, I guess you could say, just the air was filled with just, I guess, unbelief and how, how could it happen to a kid? And, and it just people just felt helpless because the South is, even now, if you go on South on 4th of July, the highway is gonna be packed all the way down, you know? Because people love to go South. It's like, it's like going to Mecca, you know? And this happened, this happened. So that atmosphere was just, a lot, a lot of sadness and, you know, a lot of unbelief. Because you, had, you, don't, you didn't have history of too many uh, kids being suffering. There was one, I'm, I don't know if you've seen a book, Without Sanctuary. The photos in there, what, a 15-year-old kid was hung with his mother. But for the most part, children were kind of exempt. Did you see, um did your family spend much time or have, have um, frequent uh, visits with Miss Tilt? After this? Yeah. After? Uh, yeah. No, we didn't because uh, 16, then there were not many automobiles like the South. Our transportation was by bus. And when I did go over there, we rode the bus to see him. So, and after, it changed her life too. Her lifestyle changed. And not only was she working, she went back to college and, and uh, she got a college degree. So she's going on with her life. And uh, she's, um, she, she got married. And uh, there's a lot of things happening in her life. So we didn't have a, have a whole lot of interaction with her 
just kind of close. And my, my father had six kids, so couldn't afford, you know, we didn't have a car, so we just didn't see her that much. We did see her, you know, there was times we did see her, but not that much. something that took a conscious, active place in your mind very often? Yes, for sure. Very, very often. And uh, because the promise that I made that night to God, I soon forgot about it. You know, trouble passed, all things righted, God is forgotten and the soldier slighted. The old saying, you know. And, but every now and then I would be reminded of that promise that I made. So it was always there <laughs> until I got it right. <laughs> so these 22, that was 16, so six years it took me that long to keep my promise. And uh, yes, it definitely, uh, I, I started feeling that if you didn't do it, and the Bible tells best not to make a promise than to make it and break it. So I said that uh, <laughs> I got to get this right. So I went to ask God to help me and I just changed. and. Very few people in, in any church, in any denomination in their 20s, you're not going to find it. Because we're trying to get some gusto. We're trying to have what we call fun. But after I changed, I said, this is the best life. I got, I'm peaceful. <laughs> this is what I'm looking for over here. So I got peace and I got happiness. Uh, so I changed and I had, no, I, have no, I had no regrets. And this is my 50 year change and I have, still have no regrets. It was a hard sell to the youngster, hard sell. Okay, we're rolling again. Mm -hmm. um, Park, when would you say, when in these years, say you're in your 20s, did you travel to Mississippi then? It was 10 years before I went back to Mississippi. 10 years. So uh, from 16, I was about 26 when I went back. And then I was conscientious of where I went and where I stopped. Where did you go? I had plenty of uncles. I got an uncle, the one they took me to his house, just died. About two years ago, he's 105. Uh, his wife, girlfriend was 69. He got divorced after fi being married 50 years. Never been on any medicine. Walked two miles every day, driving a car. <laughs> Man, I'd love to go sit. And he, his daddy was a slave. So I heard those stories. He lived to see his, his granddaddy. His granddaddy was a slave. So his granddaddy, he was born in 1903, same year Ford Motor Coaster started. And, his, and he lived to eight, uh, 1924, so he had a lot of history. So we make sure that we go by, and then I had another uncle, he just died at 100, we go by and see him. A lot of relatives. I just came from last week, still got a lot of relatives. Love to go south. Let me ask you about um, Simeon Wright and, and his parents. Did you see them much after they came up to Chicago? Oh yeah, <laughs> we lived in the same house. Oh, excuse me, of course you did. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, you know, that extended family. <laughs> yeah, my grandfather, my grandmother, they, they were characters. <laughs> they were a lot of fun. How did you, um, let me ask this question in a careful way. Would you have thought at the time that they are different now because of this, what's happened, or did they seem that their personalities were largely intact? Oh, grandma and papa after they came here. Mm -hmm. It, to me, it seemed they went on with their life, and it uh, seemed like they, uh, my grandfather had never planned to leave the South. He planned to die in the South. And uh, I think he probably had to make an adjustment. He's 60 some years old. But here, even here, he started farming, little farming right over here, where the Teal Center is. And uh, he started a little farming and got a little job, and he, he traveled. So I think he made the adjustment, okay, the kids, Maurice and Simeon and Robert, I think they were glad to leave. And grandma's here with her, with her family, so she's okay. So they had a good life down there. They had a nice house and they were not sharecroppers. I think they rented their land. So they, they had to make an adjustment. My grandfather just had, had no plans of leaving to move here. 
I think Grandma was okay because all of her sisters and brothers were here. Mm -hmm. When did when did the the Emmett Till case come back into your life, say in the form of a journalist or somebody else, a filmmaker, a documentarian, being in touch with you to talk about these things for the first time? When did that begin to happen? Do you remember? 1985. Rich Samuels from NBC came out and they did a uh, documentary. Uh, as a, He met Miss Teal as a young basketball player had been killed, Ben Wilson, that was his name, in Chicago. And she was there for support and he talked with her. And as a result, uh, he came and did the story on Emmett Teal. Up until that time, to me, it was like there was no interest in that kind of story. It's like he got what he deserved. Like I was at school speaking once, the guy said, why are we talking about Emmett Till? So he was no hero, he was a managed boy that did something that he shouldn't. I said, well, he didn't deserve to get killed. And we're here to show you what it was, history was like back then. So that's pretty much uh, the first time, Rich Samuels, and they did that, and uh, then it's like an idea whose time has come, you know, it just started happening, you know, uh, others start coming. And even now, sometimes people don't want to talk about it, you know. We, we like to embellish our history, and I tell people it's not a nice, history is not all good. In your family, everything's not all good, but you got to tell it like it is, you know. That's the only way you can free yourself, that's the only way you can Deliver yourself is exhale, let it go, get it out there and tell it like it is. So I try to make people comfortable when I tell them about the story. I'm not here to stir up any ill will, animosity, but I'm here to just to state the facts. And don't hate, don't, don't, I tell them don't hate, appreciate, because hate destroys the hater. And I'm not here to bring it up. But some of the teachers, they, they, uh, they don't, I can tell they rather not, they rather for it to go away, you know. But it happened. You got to tell it. Did you uh, have any special feelings or perspectives on uh, Reverend King's visit to, to Chicago in, uh, what, 66? I, I just, I had just started a business uh, something when a lot of civil rights was going out, I went into the army in like 62, mm -hmm. got out in 65. So I just come back to my business and uh, I could remember the hate, I could remember the, the animosity and they were saying that he needed to go back south and I could remember those times, you know, uh, the way things were then. And you wonder if things would ever change, you know, the law make you behave, but the law can't legislate the heart. And that's what I was always conscientious of, you know. The law can make you treat people a certain way within a certain realm, but what's in your heart is deep in there. You can't legislate that. So I definitely remember the King era. Mm -hmm. You worked with um, Keith, Keith Bochamp mm -hmm. when he made the film. and. Um, as momentum grew out of that effort and the federal, the um, Justice Department and the Mississippi authorities jointly reopened the case, um, what were your thoughts and feelings? Did you, how did you evaluate the prospects for this new examination all these years later? Well, I, I've often thought of what you're talking about is the, uh, all of a sudden there's interest, all of a sudden there's momentum trying to do some things. Yeah, to investigate. Yeah, and then players are coming on board. You know, it's just like everything is falling in line. And I know one person, there's a whole lot of conglomeration of things coming together. You got players, you got, um, which is not mentioned much, um, Alvin Seitz. You don't hear much about Alvin. Alvin played a pivotal role. And sometimes what I saw I didn't like because some people act like they own the story. I say, it's stupid, stupidity. I mean, it's a story that's out there, you know. And Alvin Seitz was the one that really, he came here specifically one reason to get it open because he had done a case out there in Kansas. And uh, so he, he pursued and when we went, 
I went with the album and we met with Eric Holder and Eric Holder said, referred to him as a legend in his own time. He pursued, he was a kid that did not have, a, I don't think he had a high school education, but he's well trenched in the language and I guess he studied it over and over and he pursued these senators and uh, about the Teal Bill and, uh, and uh, the, then they got Bush signed the Teal Bill that allowed what, $11 million a year for 10 years to be put toward pursuing cases dating back from 1970. Then he pursued the, appropriate, the appropriations. I thought once a bill was passed, the money's automatic. I didn't know you got anything. So he pursued that. Um, I, I, have a, I have a lot of respect for Alvin, a lot of respect for him and the work. And he's, he's so unpretentious. That's what I like about it. He's not an egotist. And you know, he's not, whoever gets the credit, you know, he doesn't worry about that. So I, I've been over there many a time to support him. So that's, that's what it was like. Mm -hmm. Let's pause for just one sec. Thanks. Let me ask, um, let me ask you to talk a little bit more about the, what you, your thoughts and your perspective as the, as the case was reopened by the Justice Department and officials in Mississippi and how you looked at that process, what range of emotions and feelings it provoked and your sense of how that was handled. Say that again. Uh, sure. The, when the case was reopened, 2004, mm -hmm. 2005, I'm interested in your range of thoughts about that as you watched mm -hmm. the things that did happen in that process, including the exhumation of the body. Mm -hmm. and um, ultimately, a decision down by Mississippi officials and others not to move forward with a, any new indictment. How, the range of emotion you felt, the range of opinion you had about how all that was handled. When they first told me that it was going to be open, I had a pessimistic view or a negative view. I say, ain't no way in the world a white man in Mississippi going to open this case against no white man. That's my first thought. Then it's a well, it's a woman. I said, maybe a white woman. Then it says a black woman. Her name is Miss Tiles. I said, well, <laughs> maybe, you know, it'll be open. Uh, then I was concerned about her, knowing Mississippi, knowing people that you can't legislate to heart. I was concerned about that, it was one of my concerns. And how else did I feel? So they gave her, the FBI did something that they wouldn't do about 50 years ago. They did the investigation. I never expected a whole lot because I know the at attitude, the atmosphere of the country. I know, I know where I'm at. I'm a realist. Never expected a whole awful lot happening quick, but you know, I know that animosity is going to be still here, you know. I don't expect no jumping in the bed type thing to happen. Okay. So they gave her the information. I met with the FBI. We did all this stuff. And, you know, this is more progress than we ever made. So you appreciate that. You respect that. Now we got the FBI literally and they're asking questions. It seems like they may be, may be kind of serious about getting to the bottom of this. So... She gave it to the grand jury. The grand jury came back say, FBI thought they had enough information to indict someone. I'm not interested in anyone getting indicted. I'm not interested in anyone going to jail. I'm interested in knowing the facts, what happened. I still want to know what happened. I want to bring some closure to this here. Ms. Bryant, I understand she wanted some wanted them to give her immunity. FBI said, we can't give you, we're not prosecuting, we're just investigating. Uh, Mr. The, young, the man that was on the truck with them uh, out of Ohio, trying to think of his name, his son out of Mayor Glendora, um, he I understand that he wanted immunity. He said he didn't know anything about it, and he wasn't there, and uh, I can't think of his name, but anyway. So all of these things are happening, and I'm just kind of going with the flow. And she said that they could not find enough information to indict uh, Mrs. Bryant. So then Alvin comes with the uh, T.O. bill, 
that helps, you know, you pursue other cases. That has its place, you know, you know. Still not bringing the closure that I want. I want to know what happened. Ms. Bryant knows what happened. That's what I would love. That, that would do me a whole lot of good. Not going to bring Emmett back, but I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. It brings closure. It gives you, to know is to have closure. And you can appreciate that. I don't want anything to happen to her. Leave the woman alone. Just, and I doubt it, even if they gave her immunity, would she tell the truth like it really happened? It would be very difficult. Um, I rode by her house with the Mississippi, University of Mississippi uh, Literary Tour. Uh, we visit what uh, Harding Carter's. I think he's from there. William Faulkner. We we did the whole. I was with, I was with a group of people I had no business with, but I was at I was there because of Emmett Till. I'm not a literary literary person, and don't claim to be. Don't try. I tried. I am who I am, you know. But anyway, it was a very interesting, informing, enlightening thing to my to me. So those are some of the feelings that I had and to meet with Eric Holden, going to the Justice Department. Those are great experiences, talking to great minds. But you're dealing with human beings, and I know I'm dealing with human beings. I know they can only go so far and only do so much. Did you ever meet Joyce Charles? Mm, no, I don't think so. I don't think I met Joyce. No, I don't think I met her. Uh, did she, maybe she did come to Chicago with the FBI. I can't, I can't remember. I, w I wouldn't say for sure. I never went down, I never met her down there. But she was courageous to do what she did, you know, to her and Ms. Bryant living in the same town. So that was quite a, you know, I had some questions about that, you know, because you're human, you're dealing with human beings, you know. You're doing this here and, you know, what's going to happen? And, uh, people are crazy. Some people's mind is not wrapped tight. <laughs> so, so I had some concerns about her, but anyway, um, she did a great job, I think she did. Did you, um, did you have a, we got in Mississippi recently as we started our conversation a while back uh, at the Freedom Trail inaugural mm -hmm. plaque ceremony mm -hmm. at the Bryant store. Um, are you able to find any sense of, um, let me ask the question this way, do you, what, what meaning do you find in all of this all these years later? I probably find more meaning in terms of history, telling history. And I was always like a little history buff. And this, it, it means more to me to see the children benefit from the history part of it than for me personally, you know. I do it because I, I went, they let me know they didn't have no money and that's how I, don't, I could pay my own way, you know, because I want the history to get out there. So I'm doing it from that perspective. I met down there with some kids from Dominican High School, a good friend of mine, Mike Small, over there. He was a pallbearer at Miss Teal's funeral. He was on the white pallbearer that was there. So uh, I feel good that I'm able to contribute. I don't let nobody try to make me a hero or something great because all I did was survive, scared as I could be, no hero. I'm just survived to tell the story, you know. So that's my take on it. I don't, I don't take, I don't try to get any miles out of it for myself. Well, I didn't do nothing. If I could have disappeared, I'd have disappeared. I wouldn't have been there, period, you know. So, and it means a lot. People are very appreciative when I when I come and, and talk. Being an eyewitness, I, I guess I'm just learning how much it means to them, you know. Because you tell it over and over, and you survived it, and it's it's something that happened that you wish hadn't happened, and it was a tragic event. But people want to hear the story, and they want to hear the truth, especially children, more so than adults. Adults, they 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 got they set in their ways, and they have their own ideas <laughs> about things. So that means a lot to me. Let me ask, um, to, as we come here to kind of the conclusion of our conversation today, let me ask you a little bit about um, the, some efforts in Mississippi here in more recent years to memorialize Emmett Till and 
we, we talked about the Freedom Trail and the, that marker. They also, um, they also designated a, a stretch of highway as the Emmett Till Memorial Highway. And um, I don't know if you know kind of the, the, the story on that coming to pass and your perspective on that. And yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think Senator Jordan had something to do with uh, presenting that to the body. And uh, I was there at the ceremony, just passed it a few days ago. I said, that sign used to be, I thought the sign was tall. It says it's been torn down a lot of times. <laughs> Not surprised. Uh, like I say, can't legislate the heart. And some people are die hard. They die hard. They are die hard. Um, it's a stretch of highway, and uh, it's good for history. And not only there, they have a marker that's going away from the highway. Uh, the Tallahatchie County. I don't know you know about them. They they are um, very much interested in the Emmett Till story. A lot of things happen there, and they have a marker at the spot at the river where his body was pulled out. They have a marker by the funeral home that had his body. They have a marker at the courthouse in Sumner and they're trying to restore that to its original uh, order. And they have a marker by the barn, it's a place where they uh, actually tormented Emmett. Uh, these are things that are you know, good for history and uh, be able to uh, go by and identify with it. It means a lot to special history concerned people. So the highway and all of those things has its place and, and some, some people use it and take advantage of some really don't like it, you know. They just really don't like it. Those, those efforts, insofar as they've happened in, in the cases we just described, those efforts seem to you well-meaning and sincere, or are the motives more complicated than mm -hmm. that? I think the uh, the people who live there have a lot of a lot of I think fire trying to right and wrongs, uh, but you can only go so far, you know. And, and I appreciate what they're doing, and uh, I think sometimes they become frustrated because again they want to change people's heart. Those kind of things don't change hearts. Believe me, they do not, and they never will. But it's good for history. Let it do what it's supposed to do, you know. And I hope they don't get just discouraged because you do all of this, and this is the 2011. So this day and time, yeah, this day and time. And the Bible says evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse. There's a revival in this country on racism. <laughs> I mean, we were regressing fast, you know. But it was there all the time. It was there all the time. So I just hope they don't get too, uh, become too wrapped up in it in the sense that they expect more than what they're gonna get. Know where, know where you're at, know what you're doing. Keep doing it, keep going. Changes have been made and changes are gonna be made. It's gonna go slow and uh, just hope to God he touch people's heart. Mm -hmm. One last question. Um, <clears throat> At times you speak to children, school children, other younger people about all of this history. Um, do you find that, that you can communicate successfully to them the true nature of all of what that history was back then, the nature of Mississippi society then? The, are they able to get a hold of mm -hmm. all of that? They're much more uh, receptive to it than the older. The older you get, the less receptive you are to it, from my experience of talking to people. I was just at the University of Missouri in uh, Columbia, Missouri, about three weeks ago. And in the college level, you find less receptiveness <laughs> than you would at eighth grade and, you know, the eighth grade level. And uh, one thing I point out to both them and blacks I say the progress and the success that black people made, there was always somebody white there to fight, start the cause. Otherwise, we would not be here. I say Abraham Lincoln got a lot of criticism the way he tried to handle the race situation. Once he sent 500 African Americans to 
Haiti and he had to go get them because they were starving. So what he did for the time was very noble and courageous. President Kennedy, President Johnson signed the Civil Rights Bill. Then I started them to thinking, and the progress that we made in all areas, the fire was in some white person's belly to stand up. Civil rights, the freedom riders, what made it really successful is when the whites came down and joined in. And the white guy said, I knew I was going to be more targeted than the blacks because they're going to hate me for coming and get with them. So I tell them, I said, look, you guys are going to be senators or whatever you are. I said, you can make the difference. Do what's right. One white kid told me once, I said, well, he said, I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to stand up. I said, you're not going to be liked. If you're staying too strong, you're not going to be liked. And then I want the blacks to appreciate how God touched hearts and how a lot of this came about. You didn't fight your way to this. Not the gun. That's why King was so bitter against violence, because you're gonna be, you're gonna be slaughtered, you know. So you have to realize that you got to work together. Together we stand, and divided we fall. Mm -hmm. It all seems still very much, um, very much with us in a very present sense. In Matilda's case, it doesn't seem. It's a hard imagining, and somehow that it's 56 years ago. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah. Because there's so much revival. There's so much just being done. He got killed 50 some years ago, but all these changes are just coming about. And it's still in the making, you know. You still hear Emmett speaking. For so many years, it, lay, it just lay dormant. There was nothing. You know, you hear about it here and there. And to, I tell people, to me, it's like the society say he got what he deserved, you know. And all of a sudden, all these changes come about. I mean, people were interested. People are, there's so much being done, you know, and uh, especially among the young people. The young people are going to have to make the changes because the old people ain't trying to change. Yeah, they ain't trying to change for the, for the most part. It's been a real honor and pleasure to be with you. Thank mm -hmm. you. Pleasure's mine. Mm -hmm. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture.